Okay. Uh, today is October 30th, 2013. We're filming an interview with uh, Norman Solomon in the Washington, D.C. home of Debbie and John Hanrahan. Uh, I'm John Hanrahan, and joining me in interviewing Norman will be uh, Ann Gallivan. And uh, filming the interview are Paul Williams and uh, Eddie Becker. This is part of the Oral History Project of Lessons of the 60s, a history of local Washington, D.C. activism for peace and justice from 1960 to 1975. Before we start, a little bit of background about uh, Norman Solomon, uh, who was a high school activist in Montgomery County and uh, the District of Columbia back in the late 1960s, when his anti-war and anti-racism activism and sharp critiques of the county's school system drew the paranoid attention of the FBI's notorious COINTELPRO spying program. Uh, we'll be concentrating on those earlier years in the interview today, but first wanted to mention some of Norman's uh, remarkable achievements as an activist, news media critic, columnist, author, filmmaker, and founder of and contributed to contributor to important activist organizations in the decades since. Uh, here are just a few of his achievements. Uh, Norman is the author or co-author of more than a dozen books, including uh, Made Love, Got War, Close Encounters with America's Warfare State, which uh, chronicles his lifelong commitment to uh, <clears throat> nonviolent anti-war. Uh, anti-nuclear and pro-social justice activism, in which covers some of his uh, activism in the D.C. area in the early, his early years. Among Nor Norman's major books is War Made Easy, How Presidents and Pundits Keep Spinning Us to Death, whether it's in Vietnam, Iraq, or any of the contrived military adventures of U.S. presidents of both political parties over the last five decades. War Made Easy is also uh, made into a highly praised documentary that came out in 2007 at the height of the U.S. war against Iraq. Among Norman's more than uh, a dozen uh, books uh, are Target Iraq, What the News Media Didn't Tell You, uh, co-authored with noted foreign correspondent Reese Ehrlich, Wizards of Media Oz, Behind the Curtain of Mainstream News, The Power of Babel, The Politician's Dictionary of Buzzwords, and Double Talk for Every Occasion, uh, Killing Our Own, The Disaster of America's Experience with Atomic Radiation, uh, co-authored with Harvey Wasserman, and so many more. Uh, Norman is the founding director of the Institute for Public Accuracy, a consortium of policy researchers and, and analysts, for which he was executive director from 1997 to 2010. Uh, for many years, Norman has been an associate of the respected media watch group FAIR, that's fair, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, and previously headed FAIR's Washington, D.C. Uh, office. He is a co-founder of Grassroots Nation, which currently has more than 400,000 active members. And last summer, the group gathered more than 100,000 signatures in an online petition to urge the Nobel Committee to award the Nobel Peace Prize to Private Bradley, now Chelsea Manning. Uh, Norman personally carried the petitions to uh, Oslo, Norway. And uh, finally, in addition, Norman wrote the national, nationally syndicated Media Beat column for 17 years and has written op-ed pieces for numerous U.S. and overseas publications, as well as making numerous appearances on U.S. and overseas radio and television uh, news and politics program programs. Uh, so uh, let's get into the interview here. Uh, welcome, uh, Norman. And Thanks, I guess John. If we could start out with just a little of your own background, where you were born, grew up, who your parents were, and, uh, and family uh, uh, in those early years the years we're going to be talking about. Yeah, thanks. Well, I grew up mostly in the Washington suburbs in Maryland. I uh, was born uh, in George Washington Hospital, but uh, raised the first five years in Greenbelt, Maryland. Then various uh, visits for two or three years to suburbs in, let's see, Cleveland, Ohio, Wilmington. My father was in the precursor to the aid program. Uh, and so we went to India when I was nine years old. I was born in 1951, so this was 59 to 61. 18 months in Calcutta with, uh, I think they called it Technical Cooperation Mission, but U.S. aid program, and then came back to Silver Spring, Maryland when I was about 10. So um, from there, I just sort of acculturated or tried to, to suburban uh, USA mm -hmm. of the 1960s. Did, um, when you were in India, did that have any uh, impact on your uh, later uh, activism? Did that hit you at the time? Did it hit you later? Uh, well, I think it was sort of a delayed mm -hmm. impact because, you know, my interests when I was living in Wilmington, Delaware, and all of a sudden we packed off to India in 1959 were hot dogs and baseball. 
you mm -hmm. know that was basically it and then to see uh, people with you know, limbs that were so thin uh, these to remind me of the uh, you know when you're learning to write with a pencil in grade school is very those brown pencils yes, just yeah. so thin and so it's yeah. so far from anything I had mm -hmm. ever seen or even heard of in Calcutta to see people on the streets but it, you know nine years old it was I absorbed it but couldn't really grasp it very mm -hmm. much but coming back to Silver Spring Maryland in 1961 in the suburbs there was certainly a disconnect and I think at least semi-consciously I knew that not mm -hmm. everybody lived that way as suburban American. Mm -hmm. So you ended up uh, back here and you went to what, junior high and... Uh, yeah, I went to high, Eastern uh, Junior High School and Montgomery Blair High Montgomery School Blair, yes. and uh, uh, was scheduled to graduate in 1969 from Blair High. Right, well, and we'll get to <laughs> a little bit of that schedule too. <laughs> um, what, what was sort of your earliest activism and what sort of triggered that or inspired that or, or prodded you into that, what, uh, however it happened? Well, I got interested in uh, journalism in junior high and was on the school paper, and my very tentative efforts to write any sort of critique of any power structure, which most immediately was the junior high school administration, got you know a little bit of pushback. So I thought, oh, well, this is interesting. When you write something, if people in power don't like it, that can have some ripple effects, you know, for, mm -hmm. for good, good or ill. And then I saw an ad uh, for a Saturday's job at the Montgomery County Sentinel, which was the weekly paper based in Rockville, and I applied for that, and it must have been like maybe 15 and a half, something like that, and got the job. So on Saturdays, I would either my mother would take me partway or all the way, or I would take a very winding DC Transit bus up to Rockville from Silver Spring and spend the Saturdays. Uh, at that point, the uh, Sentinel was a newsroom above the pool hall. Yeah, and. Uh, I would learn, you know, by doing, as Dewey said, but I had, to, you know, at least a little bit of rudiments of how to write. So I eventually ascended to being the teen page editor of the, right. <laughs> of the Sentinel while I was still in high school. So that, that was a lot of my Saturdays in my last uh, couple mm -hmm. of years in, mm -hmm. in, uh, of high school. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, things, I'm trying to remember if this was in the, the FBI file that you obtained in the late 80s, uh, that one of the items, I'm trying to remember if the Spiro Agnew item was in your file or if that was separate and apart from the file, but that's sort of interesting that one of your first um, uh, activities was campaigning for... Right, my electoral work wasn't in the FBI file that I, I later got yeah, through okay. Freedom of Information Act request, but it was sort of simultaneous that I think that would have been 1966. Um, the first activism I did, really, uh, of, a, of any non-traditional type was to picket Summit Hill's apartments in Silver Spring, which were segregated at the time, and the mm -hmm. activist group Access was calling picket lines there. And so for mm -hmm. the first time, I went out there, so I'm 15 years old, I got acclimated fairly soon. It's not something that mm -hmm. I was used to, you know, I'd never done it before, mm -hmm. but just picketing to desegregate. Uh, so that was pretty much simultaneous with my um, electoral work, which is going door to door with pamphlets, you know, mm -hmm. sticking them in the screen door or whatever. Uh, I saw it as against the Democratic nominee for, actually, to Yeah, you should explain it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a primary uh, for governor in 1966. I did some leafleting for Carlton Sickles, who was a liberal congressperson at the time, and he lost to a racist candidate, uh, George Mahoney. So uh, that being the result of the primary, I passed out literature for Spiro Agnew, who was the moderate Republican running against right. the racist Democrat. Right. Yes. Yeah. That was uh, happened to a lot of people at the time. Surprisingly, yeah. that. Um, th but when you mentioned uh, access, do you, do you remember how you that that group by was for action, coordinating committee to end segregation in the suburbs? And do you remember how you got wind of that? How you uh, what some of the picket lines were like? Whether you had a lot of feedback from residents or passersby, uh, positive uh, or negative. I yeah. remember it was very controversial. This was the time that fair housing was such in, so much in dispute in the state and the country. Mm -hmm. I remember the black and white uh, buttons we put on access and then carrying the signs along the, the road there. And I remember it, you know, 
positive and negative calls from people driving mm -hmm. by and so forth. And uh, among my classmates then, which would have been maybe the very beginning of high school or end of junior high, um, there was a lot of strong opinion among my white classmates. Some were supportive of integration, mm -hmm. others, you know, some of them from the South, mm -hmm. so, no, keep things like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, among uh, your fellow students at that time, were uh, many of them joining picket lines, or were you among the first in your uh, school or your acquaintance to... Oh, the to people do? I knew, I was the only mm -hmm. one in school, per se. I mm -hmm. mean, that changed within a year mm -hmm. or two. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, yeah, as somebody else right up there on East-West Highway, one, one of the major thoroughfares in the uh, county, so there would be a lot of yeah. traffic going by there. Um, then um, you had, uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, that you filed a Freedom of Information Act request on yourself in the sometime in the 1980s and um, got a heavily redacted uh, bunch of documents back. Was there uh, any, and I'll talk about some of the things in there, but were there any things in there that just really shocked or surprised you? Uh, uh, the fact that they were spying on a lot of 15, 16, 17-year-old uh, kids and what the extent of the spying was. Yeah, I, w I was surprised that they would bother with uh, high school students. I mean, I knew a bit historically, you know, my, my parents were at least even Democrats. They were certainly supportive of the Civil Rights Movement and they referred to the McCarthy era in very negative terms. Um, and when the FOIA request sent back the 15 or so pages, I was surprised that I would be watched, that I formed, I helped with students form, initially we called it the student union and then we broadened it out the following school year, which would have been my, was beginning of my senior year, late 68, to the Montgomery County Student Alliance. And we organized very effectively at uh, most of the 18 high schools. We caused quite a commotion. So I could sort of see why, given mm -hmm. the, the paranoid atmosphere mm -hmm. under Hoover and the fact that while we were Mm -hmm. mostly talking about student rights and not being so suppressed and repressed, we also opposed uh, military recruiters having unfettered access to information about students and un mm -hmm. unanswered access mm -hmm. to propagandize by coming to the high schools. That sort of spilled over into anti-war um, mm -hmm. work as far as the FBI was concerned. So I thought it was, it was mm -hmm. just r ridiculous, uh, you know, 15 years later to learn about that scene uh, so, and also some of those documents showed that then I was tracked a few years later. I uh, was, I quickly dropped out of college when I moved to Portland, Oregon, but I was mimeographing out and sending out uh, radical poetry and anti-war stuff. And at that time, I mean, it seems crude by today's internet standards, but we would just mimeograph or Xerox or whatever was the equivalent of Xerox then, and then mail it out. You know, so I would go to the local post office. It turned out that the FBI report said that I was bringing radical literature to my local post office, which mm -hmm. I then realized somebody working behind the counter was telling the FBI I was doing this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, uh, it, it, as far as the Student Alliance was concerned, uh, you had a thousand or so members, I think you recall you saying once. Well, it was uh, yeah. pretty amazing yeah. in that we sort of pushed for the right to le leaflet in the lunchrooms and, and, and got that. Mm -hmm. We created a lot of tension in the Montgomery County school system hierarchy because it was ostensibly liberal, but we were pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. So we were able to get the message out. I remember there was a DJ at a radio station up in Rockville, which was playing what we called underground music, and he would put us on the air to promote, which helped. So mm -hmm. there was one meeting of the county school board, we got six or seven hundred students out, which was unprecedented. I think we're talking very early 1969. Mm -hmm. So there was a sense of, of momentum in that way. Is that about the time that you uh, issued a report, uh, a scathing uh, critique mm -hmm. of the school system? Uh, yes, we figured that we'd need to mm -hmm. put out a platform. It was a long report. It was called Wanted a Humane Education. I wrote it with some other students, and it was part of our, you might say, manifesto. And at some point, and this filtered in with there was work for the great boycott and solidarity for the farm workers who were organizing in Delano and elsewhere in California. So that merged together. I mean, it was student rights, but it's sort of in retrospect, 
it makes sense. People organize with what affects them closely, but then given that the war was directly and indirectly affecting us and mm -hmm. social justice issues such as farm workers and, and racism, that was the ambience, you might say, the micro zeitgeist within which our student alliance was mm -hmm. growing. And at some point, it must have been late 1968 or so, I met Brent Dillingham and Debbie Barger, who were with a group called Compeers. Right. And they were doing some organizing, including out in Montgomery County among students. And I think they, I would say they had a very light touch and a very focused way of encouraging and supporting us as students to do what we wanted to do. And so it's a sort of example that when we wrote up that report, and we probably weren't very good typists, I know I wasn't, but it was a long report. And uh, uh, Debbie typed it up. And then we had copies, and we went to the school board, and we went to the press. And I remember uh, one of the critiques from some of the uh, uh, folks who didn't like what we were doing said that we couldn't have written this report because students weren't capable of writing <laughs> something like that. Actually, it turned out we were because we, we, we did it, but it helped to give us some momentum. Mm -hmm. The uh, When you mentioned... Uh, I'm going to do one thing. Keep talking. Okay. Uh, right. When you mentioned... Um, and doing and there uh, might as well keep along that that track is the setup uh, uh, there was something that is uh, called Freedom House in uh, Bethesda tell us a little about that how that <laughs> influenced your future uh, career uh, in court <laughs> well this is the trajectory of you know the the per personal evolution and then the sort of the social groups because mm -hmm. from my you know, particular vantage point I'm a sophomore in high school I supposed to be a, a lawyer or a mathematician or something as the expectation of me and I gradually realized I wasn't interested in that course and then of course the counterculture energy in 67 the music the marijuana the social activism I went to my first anti-war march in April 1967 there was a train out of Union Station to New York and so that opened up for me the importance of being involved in anti-war efforts and then the cultural pulls were very powerful away from lockstep. But meanwhile, I'm supposed to get good grades. I think I was you know, sophomore class president. I was getting good mm -hmm. grades until my senior year, and until 68. I think I went uh, in the fall of that year from A's to C's to F's because I wasn't that interested. Mm -hmm. And I noticed if you don't show up to school, you're probably not going to get a passing grade, I discovered. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I gone to California in the spring break and I came back in 69 and so this was for me overlaid with what was happening with the student mm -hmm. lines organizing because mm -hmm. in January that year we we issued the report around then we had this mass turnout to the school board a lot of press coverage mm -hmm. so that's January by April my attitude is screw it why should I go back to high school even for a couple of months because I don't even believe in that anymore mm -hmm. uh, and so more and more I was drawn to the um, activism outside of the schools, and so by the time mm -hmm. April was happening, meanwhile this Freedom House office had been set up, I think with Compeer's help mm -hmm. and backup, in a downtown area in Bethesda, so we were doing organizing out of there, and we were hanging out, and there was music and everything else, and so at that point, um, Police issues start coming up because the police are harassing us for political and marijuana reasons, mm -hmm. and you know, keep keep the riffraff out, sort of ideas. But it's it's undermining the fabric of the war uh, the war tapestry, you might say, mm -hmm. in Bethesda and elsewhere. And you know, we keep in mind these are middle level and sometimes even higher middle level administration officials. Of course, by then it's begun to be Nixon, but still in all, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, they're part of this machinery that's keeping the war escalating. And so those conflicts, I, I felt, were sort of metaphorical. You know, they were uh, representations of that conflict, or mm -hmm. some might say the contradictions within a, a society that has all this humanistic rhetoric, but meanwhile is burning people in Vietnam, and also uh, suppressing people at home, because I came to see by spring of 69 that repressing people in high school was part of getting them lockstep into the military and that the obedience culture was a, a, a through line through all that, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, I, at that point, wouldn't, didn't want to go back to high school in April 
uh, that year and began to just hang around Freedom House. And uh, there was more and more of like a hostility in both directions with police. And then I got involved in one day, one night, we went out and spray painted parking meters at the parking garage across the street. And there were anti war slogans on the walls like, revolt for peace. You know? and, I, and so I was arrested for doing that. I mm -hmm. didn't get away quite fast enough. Um, and I remember the Washington Post, there was an article at some point about that. And there was a picture, and I think they had a picture that had the words revolt for peace. Mm -hmm. And that was perhaps my proudest moment, because <laughs> whatever other problems there were in communication through that action, at least that was a clear statement. And you know, mm. I remember around that point, or soon after that, Nixon was going to Guam to meet with Chu to plan further escalation of the war, or the so-called Vietnamization, certainly escalation of the air war. And my feeling was, um, well, I'm, in, I'm part of this grand revolt, or what Marcos would call the grand refuse, great refusal. And, gee, we got this message in the Washington Post, so right. that people making the war would have to see that, that their kids, or some of them, were saying mm -hmm. revolt for peace, which you know, was part of the, the strategy, mm -hmm. uh, however clearly or unclearly thought out. And you know, during that time, 68 and 69, I had met more and more people who were in various parts of the anti-war movement and SDS. I'd gone to a regional SDS conference in 68. So, was getting more and more acquainted with some of the um, you know, radical analysis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The um, when uh, it just remind me you mentioned uh, SDS. I think you recalled in your uh, book knowing uh, Kathy Wilkerson. I was wondering if did that prop, prop up in your FBI file at all at that. And how did you happen to know? Uh, Kind of yeah, well, I of, met of the yeah. weather later of the weather underground. Yeah, yeah uh, I'd met on the train to the April '67 um, anti-war march in Manhattan. Uh, a radical attorney named Bill Higgs, uh, who had a, um, a house in what was then a slum area of Northeast uh, Washington, since gentrified, just a few mm -hmm. blocks from Union Station, and uh, so got to know uh, Bill, and he was he would. Uh, hang out with a lot of SDS people. I would go to Thomas Circle to visit Liberation News Service, and in his like de facto salons, although it's silly to use that term maybe because it was very down at the heels <laughs> living room, but so uh, the proletariat salon, you know, uh, Bill would have a lot of people there. So I met folks from SDS, including Kathy Wilkerson, and she was also organizing in the suburbs among students as well as elsewhere. So I remember we would invite her out to the high school or different things like that. At that point, she was very much make mainline SDS uh, from say early six, well early '68. The convention uh, in Chicago in August of '68, you know, was part of that more radicalizing process. And in a way, I think, you know, especially in retrospect, some of the SDS folks, and I think probably Kathy was among them. Um, to some degree, I don't think she was like way out in the extreme at that point, but uh, were uh, supercharged by the violence in the streets and sort of getting off on violence and seeing that that was a necessary part of resisting the war, which you know mm -hmm. I think clearly was a mistake in retrospect, uh, if not clear at the time. And uh, Kathy, among others, became part of the Weather Underground within like a year or two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, did you uh, in in the Student uh, activism. Did, was it? Uh, did you have any uh, connections with the students in other neighboring jurisdictions, D.C., Prince George's, or any of that? Or was it pretty much? We were pretty much county. Yeah. We focused on Montgomery County in terms of the school system. Mm -hmm. Can you redo that question for that? We had a beep. Oh. Okay. Uh, you asked whether the there was. Yeah. Whether there. Whether you had any. Uh, 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 Connections uh, with the uh, school systems, students in other jurisdictions, Montgomery and Prince George's, yeah. D.C., etc. Our student alliance work was pretty much focused in Montgomery County, and that is sort of reflective of the times. I mean, it's a very segregated uh, mm -hmm. time within the county and certainly right. the, bay, the the entire uh, D.C. area. Right. So you uh, did not graduate from uh, high school, or did you get 
that's it. I, I was told when I came back in April that I should uh, do a paper or two and I would get a degree, and I said I don't want to do that, so I never got a high school I diploma. I thought I remembered that, because you were, and I think you even talked about it in your book, you were sort of seen as the model student. I think you said you were not didn't see yourself as a quote-unquote troublemaker or words to that effect, and then no, suddenly it, you were. <laughs> it, was a, it was a progression or degression, depending on how you look at it, from sophomore, junior, you know, uh -huh. high, high, high achieving on paper, you know, to senior year just falling off the table in terms of having any sort of academic uh, cre uh, credibility with the school. And at that point, I felt like, oh, I don't believe in this, so I won't do it. And... Uh, of course, my parents were aghast because education, Brooklyn College and so forth, had been key to their own lives. Mm -hmm. And so for me to just throw that away, they thought that was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, and Bill Higgs encouraged us to do this, but ultimately we did it as students. We had some interns, like Joel Denker was one of them from Antioch College out at Blair High School. We formed a free school in senior year. So that was another parallel track going for me because down in Park Road near Rock Creek Park, we had a huge house and that was a free school. So I was spending more time there, even in my early senior year, than I was in the official high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, um, getting back to the, uh, the uh, parking meter incident, you uh, went into court and uh, what happened uh, there? I think I went into court on my 18th birthday. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can you? I, I'm sorry, can you start again? Sure. I just hit the camera back. Yeah. I went to court on my 18th birthday? Yeah. I went to court on my 18th birthday. I got a uh, sentence to go to work and earn back the 600 something dollars that it cost the county to replace like 180 plastic parking meter faces. And you know, I'm surprised it was that cheap. Of course, that was $1969, <laughs> but you know, they had to take Revolt for Peace off the walls and all that. So I was in a situation where I needed to earn that money, which was, you know, the last thing I wanted to do. Uh, mm -hmm. But that was the, uh, the requirement at that point. And that summer, too, July of uh, 69, I, I think that for a combination of reasons, I mean, it's sort of good news, bad news, there was some very good hashish then. Uh, and so I was enjoying, you know, if you would listen to the Steve Miller band on hashish, the Sailor album, it was a very good experience. On the other hand, it was not in a um, uh, situation in my life where it was helpful for me to understand all these quick changes going on. Mm -hmm. And so I think I, I think there were some, frankly, mental health issues going on there that summer mm -hmm. in, under that stress. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sort of juggling that at the same time. And then when you turn 18, there's another experience that's mandated by law, which I was aware of, of course, if you're a male, and that was to register the draft board. And you know, getting ready to uh, come into this room for the interview, I remembered, oh, don't, don't I carry this thing around in my I never got around to burning it. This is my draft card. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was tempted many times to burn this. For the Smithsonian. <laughs> yeah, right. So it, it has my birth date. It has a signature of um, a woman named, I think, looks like Virginia Vogel. And it has um, a stamp on the back and uh, a date of when I registered for the draft, which I went. And to give you sort of an exa example or indication of my frame of mind, if you didn't want to go into the military, you were supposed to, if you wanted a conscientious objector uh, status, you would apply, make an application uh, on the appropriate form. Well, I went down to the draft board in Silver Spring, and um, I pulled a leaf off a tree outside the draft board, and I said, this is my application for conscientious objector status, which it would surprise no one that I got 1A status, you know, as a result, this was just not very convincing. So um, at that point, I just took off. I, I uh, made a little bit of money from some article that I wrote that was put in anthology. And back then you could fly to California for $75. So I flew to California for $75. Did you have anything particular in mind going to California? Uh, just, getting away from the East Coast. Just to, okay. <laughs> that was a good start. Uh -huh. um, and I was going to hang out and write in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and then a reporter from the Washington Post read something I wrote for the San Francisco Good Times Weekly, a guy named Larry Feinberg. I thought it might have been. Yes. He had covered our, our student alliance work, and so he saw that, and he, he reached me through the weekly paper, and I just figured, what the heck, I was living in Mill Valley in Marin County. So he did an article about me, and then my parents called and they said, 
the judge saw the article about you in the post and he's angry because you're supposed to be back here earning money to pay off the fine. And so they said, you're, you're in trouble. So I uh, worked my way back. Uh, I caught a ride back uh, at least to New Mexico, and I forget how I got back from there, and um, found a job. I, I raked leaves for a few days, which was really very informative. What is it like to rake leaves for mm -hmm. eight hours a day? You know, these mm -hmm. were mostly black workers, just driving around, and we used to talk about, we're raking leaves for rich people, you know, uh, that for some reason the county, I think, was paid to do. It's probably, mm -hmm. some, you know, some good safety or environmental reason to do that. But, and then um, uh, Roger Farquhar at the Sentinel lot offered me a job mm -hmm. to go back there, and this time it would be full-time rather than on Saturday. So I worked there, I think, mm -hmm. full-time for four months and then part-time for two more months until I got that wonderful letter in the mail that said you're no longer on probation, <laughs> and I was out like a you know a cat with the door open back mm -hmm. in California. Then, mm -hmm. but in the interim, I was the business page editor. I was the religion page editor. Since I don't mm -hmm. believe in religion or business, it was perfect. You That's know? right. But I very learned, well you know, the rudiments. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Did um, just uh, before <coughs> we leave uh, uh, Bethesda in the D.C. area, that uh, um, and should full disclosure that uh, Paul Williams is filming is of course uh, Brent Dillingham's. Uh, nephew and Brent was a very good friend of mine and uh, and Anne's. Um, but uh, do you, what what do you recall about him as to his style, his humor, his approach to uh, uh, his well, approach to social justice? Uh, Brent was warm and acerbic, which yeah. is was not an oxymoron with him at all. He yeah. was uh, he had an incredibly uh, uh, sarcastic, uh, discerning way to describe situations. His, his political uh, perspective was very well developed. He was a gut level progressive on all the issues. I remember he was working against the ABM pretty soon. You know, it was very visionary. You don't have an anti ballistic missile system, least of all around Washington, if you want to prevent nuclear war. And um, also, the organizing uh, process was good because uh, he and uh, Debbie Barker were very respectful of us, but encouraged us to think more deeply and gave us. You know, very minimal but still meaningful resources, uh, so that we could, you know, mm -hmm. you'll get things done. And it was also very a multi-issue outlook, so that mm -hmm. war, social justice, racism, poverty, these connections were were really, uh, really clear. Were you around uh, uh, for the free press, Washington Free Press controversy when Brent was arrested for trying to? Burst? Well, you can yes. describe the incident. Yeah. Yes, very, very much the th concurrent with my my own sort of uh, evolution as a high school student to a dropout to whatever. In early '69, the Washington Free Press being I think, one issue banned by a county judge and the police uh, being sort of enforcers. That was all mixed in with the gray boycott work, the police mm -hmm. harassment, uh, and I felt that it was all becoming one big issue, which in a sense it was. As a matter of fact, I think I went to at least one of the days of the trial, one of the trials that uh, Brent had around this. As I remember he took a banned copy of the Washington Free Press and sold it in front of the uh, police station but yes. and in Montgomery County. So that's, uh, you know, talk about going out of your way to make a test case. That's what he, he mm -hmm. did. And I want to say the attorney he had a great attorney, uh, Joe Forer. Yes, and I saw yeah. Joe Forer at work, and was in the courtroom, and so that was clearly a symbol of what was going on. It was such an extreme, you know, it's what stereotypically you would expect of a right-wing county, but it was going on in Montgomery County. Yeah, there was uh, there were some sessions, uh, and I was wondering if you were in any of those where they really got raucous from the audience. Maybe it's when he was found guilty of there were young people with I don't know, pigs masks and climbing up on I don't even remember. I think I, I wasn't there for the that, verdict but I was there during one of the testimony days yeah uh -huh, yeah. yeah the um, so uh, yeah so he was I mean just the postscript of that is he eventually the uh, Supreme Court of Maryland overturned what was known as the Ober law on obscenity saying this didn't meet the, that there was an unconstitutional law so there was some uh, value well, was, to the the you know I think it was a great uh, case which in this case to flip it, the cliche and said, great case made great law, you know, in yes. that it was obscenity that was, uh, you know, 
worthy of Jonathan Swift. I'm not saying it was a great cartoon or whatever. No. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But the politics and the supposed obscenity, it was all, it was a caricature. It was a political statement that was mm -hmm. being made in the course of what was published in, mm -hmm. in, in the free press. Uh, should have asked you this beforehand. Did you uh, read the uh, uh, short story of the movie is based on the loneliness of the long distance runner? In that a, a, a young kid is in reform school, he's, they discover that he's a great cross-country runner and the warden is, knows he's going to beat his rival uh, uh, prisons with uh, this kid and, and he trains and seems to be going along with the system and then he's well ahead in the race, stops ah. just short of the finish line. The movie sort of ends with him just sort of glaring at the furious warden standing on the sidelines where he won't cross the finish. I was wondering if the parking meters was sort of your... Loneliness of the <laughs> long distance runner moment when he said, "I'm going over to the other." Uh, it, it could be. Know. I mean, I, I yeah. think it was um, a reassessment of what my own identity was or should be, mm -hmm. and that was though disorienting because I, I hadn't planned to get arrested, but I thought, well, it wasn't a terrible thing. But a lot of the people I'd grown up with thought it was a terrible thing, mm -hmm. and uh, also I experienced then what that would mean when there was sort of a stigma attached to what one had done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you probably, I, I assume we're getting from a lot of adults and uh, uh, people your own age, uh, Norman, what's what's going on with you? What happened to you? Why are you doing this? Yeah, going off off course. Yeah, yeah There was a yeah. sense that you, know, you, you, you were headed in a good direction. You've gone bad, but so much of that, I think it's true probably of young people of all eras, if they're at all you know, alert, is mm -hmm. that the political social climate is the context that we're growing up in. And I think if I had grown up five years earlier, I might have ended up in law school, you mm -hmm. know, but with the Vietnam War going on and all this other terrible stuff, it seemed to me just absurd to, mm -hmm. to be in any sense uh, fundamentally obedient. I just wanted to ask you one or two things, then Anne probably has some questions to chime in with here. Um, that one of the uh, FBI documents uh, from June uh, 1969 reported that special FBI agents attended a meeting that you and apparently two other Student Alliance uh, members attended uh, at the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare with about 30 uh, federal employees. It was sort of, a, I guess, an informal uh, uh, discussion group, and many of them were members of, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, Federal Employees for a Democratic Society. But, it, uh, I mean, isn't this somewhat a... Maybe not in retrospect, it was, would be astounding when you first learned it that, uh, I, that yeah. this was monitored also. Both I groups, yeah. I wouldn't have particularly expected that a meeting with some government employees that was totally open would have been uh, shadowed and surveilled by the FBI. I, I would guess what happened was, it was probably through uh, Brent Dillingham, that there were networks, informal and otherwise, of people who were concerned with social justice and uh, opposing the war in Vietnam, and we're always looking for cracks in the walls of ways to communicate and, and organize. Mm -hmm. And our, our Student Alliance was sort of a hybrid of a lot of different concerns. And of course, when you're 16 or 17, there are a lot of different motivations. I mean, breaking out of the straitjackets could be everything from having sex with your girlfriend to doing drugs to uh, going to a demonstration to refusing to go to school. Mm -hmm. You know, all that mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. part of a broader rebellion and, you know, without putting, uh, being too reductionist about it, I guess would be a way to say it, there was a repressive apparatus. So if you flip it over and you say, well, people doing what they're told in all those realms was part of the program to keep the corporate system going, keep the mm -hmm. war making going, there was, you know, generally um, an enforced track that was really effective. I mean, in the suburbs, it sort of broke down at the very last year or two of the uh, 60s. But I would say in Montgomery County as elsewhere, even then, most people in my high school never participated in certainly the anti-war work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I should mention at those HEW meetings, at least two of the members of our Lessons of the 60s groups would have been attending oh, those. And I asked uh, one of them who said she had never uh, actually done a FOIA uh, for that time and uh, was interested to hear this uh, this information, um, that 
then just and then you did uh, at some point seventy seventy one and went, uh, <coughs> went to the west coast to uh, uh, read college I believe. And, yeah, yeah uh, when I was liberated from the um, authority of the uh, Montgomery County court system in the spring of nineteen. Uh, 1970, mm -hmm. I remember um, got the 63 Plymouth that my parents had and they let me drive it to the West Coast and um, I was hearing about Earth Day on the radio, the first Earth Day was happening as I was driving westward uh, at, that, at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, got to Berkeley in time for when Jackson State and Kent State happened, so I got to sample the tear gas there and so forth in Berkeley and then went up to college and read. I'd taken a year off, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I got a student. Well, no, at that point, there was a lottery. Mm -hmm. And that summer, there was a lottery, and I got the highest possible number, 365. So the draft suddenly became not an issue. And mm -hmm. I, I went, went to college for you know, all of a semester. Did you always feel the draft looming over you? I mean, as, uh, did you think about it a lot? Did that, in, did that make you uh, more uh, intent on doing what you were doing uh, to fight the war, or did it? I think it was a factor. As a matter yeah. of fact, I'm remembering uh, when I was uh, on the staff of Silver Chips newspaper, which was the paper at Blair High School, and wrote, apart from that role, wrote a letter to the editor that was published. I was disagreeing with an official editorial of the newspaper written by the students in favor of student deferments. And I said in that mm -hmm. letter, um, there shouldn't be student deferments because we would know and I used the cliche, war is hell. We would know war is hell if we have to experience it or at least have to deal with not being exempted from the draft. And uh, so I was, you know, but I, I was conscious of it. Um, at the same time, uh, it was part of just broader, you know, broader mm -hmm. concerns in that mm -hmm. way. Because events were, of course, moving you in a certain direction. Were there any uh, individuals, uh, whether you knew personally or... Um, just philosophically through their books of that that really had an impact on you that uh, during that time? Yeah, very much. Uh, yeah. There was a, uh, well, reading Ramparts Magazine, seeing the pictures in there, 67, 68. Uh, they'd exposed the National Student Association being infiltrated by, I think, CIA. But then also they had these very powerful pictures of the war in mm -hmm. Vietnam, they had powerful articles. Uh, there was a doctor uh, who opposed the war, who had been in the military, I think Howard Levy was his name. Yes. There was a um, Navy uh, person who, he was an enlisted man or draftee in the Navy. He opposed the war, I'm forgetting his name. He spoke in the D.C. area. There were a lot of people. Um, there was an elderly guy, Van Leer, Carlos Van Leer. He had his signs, you know. Yeah. Uh, I remember that was very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, vigils in front of the White House and so forth. A, a lot of people, and a lot of people who came through and spoke. I remember going out to uh, Cedar Lane Unitarian Church, hearing a lot of anti-war speakers. Mm -hmm. Dick Gregory, in the very beginning of the 60s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just to interject, Carlos Van Leer, I remember he, he also did uh, sort of satirical songs, as I recall. <laughs> he was very, uh, and, and later was with the Grey Panthers. Uh, very active in that. Yeah, I think it's a, just an, an instance of how, we, you know, we never know what effects we have on other people. I mean, I know I was profoundly affected by people who would never know that. Mm -hmm. This is the way things are. Um, at, at some point, we'll ask me about, you know, how, what you've uh, learned over the years and that. And we, as I said at the beginning, we're covering mainly the 60 to 75 period. But uh, I was wondering if, uh, just in some of your more recent accomplishments, if you, and I'd, I'd like to guess ask you about, uh, particularly about what I th what I think anyway is your most important book, War Made Easy, uh, why you wrote it, uh, how and why it was made into a film documentary with the involvement mm -hmm. of Sean Penn and your own trips to Iraq with him. I think that would be good to have on this. Well, I feel there was a continuum back from about '67. Mm -hmm. because having read and heard people and then going to the demonstration in New York, I was drawn into a swirl of people who were sharing insights. They were intellectual, they were historical. Uh, I don't think I read much Bernard Fall, but enough you know, to grasp that something wasn't comporting with the official mm -hmm. story. And then that um, 
evolved and a lot of what I learned was that when country goes to war that a lot of people, most people, will just say that that's okay. And so it's a visceral, it was a visceral sort of learning because mm -hmm. with all the differences from the Vietnam War, I mean I was pretty much paying attention even very early on, soon after the Gulf of Tonkin, which I was 13 at the time. Uh, and so I saw, you know, this war can just escalate, escalate, escalate. and there's a tremendous pressure for obedience. And when I sort of got that, then the answer to how could the Third Reich get acceptance from German people, it wasn't that puzzling to me mm -hmm. because I could see that. And then every, with all the differences of the different wars, every war ever since, which is all, have all been, as I wrote about in War Made Easy, based on deception, they all None of them are cookie cutter, but they're all part of more of a general pattern. So that was very uh, informative to me. And also that passivity is the enemy of doing anything decent in those contexts. Mm -hmm. So when I could see other opportunities, and you know, I had plenty of role models as I was growing up that I learned mm -hmm. from, but when I've been able to see that I could do something like um, Saddam Hussein invites members of Congress in 2002 to come and inspect for weapons, and it's just blown off by the White House and the leaders in Congress, virtually everybody in Congress. And the so, press. Yeah. yeah, and the press just, oh, this is just propaganda. And while, yes, members of Congress are not qualified to do weapons inspections, it was still an opening for some sort of discourse other than just hurling threats between Baghdad and Washington. So for me, a light bulb did go on. Well, we can do something. I founded the Institute for Public Accuracy at that point. We had a modicum of resources. So ended up going on three trips there, including with the first member of Congress to ever visit Iraq during the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. And we opened up some stuff. I mean, I'm sure that it really angered the White House that we took Congressman Nick Rahal to meet with Tariq Aziz and people in Baghdad in September 2002. Uh, and then a few days later, I, you know, I wouldn't say causality, but I'd say simultaneity anyway. A few days later, uh, Hussein's government announces they're going to let back UN weapons inspectors for the first time in four years. You know, I'm mm -hmm. very excited by that. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, then two other trips after that. Mm -hmm. And and so that the book I assume then was probably germinating all these these years. I mean, you've yeah. written uh, we have several of them here on the table: press uh, analysis, uh, press criticism, and particularly in matters of war and peace and how we're lured in, lied to, suckered. This sort of was a culmination then of all of, uh, of really what you'd been doing all those years. Yeah, very much a learning process. I think mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the people who really have insights into media, media bias are activists because we're involved in issues, we know issues, we organize events, and we see that through omission and commission how terrible the media coverage generally is with some exceptions in the mass media. So I feel like I got really educated through that course of events, beginning when I, I was in high school. And mm -hmm. I mean, when we were, when we would uh, do Student Alliance work, I would talk with Brent Dillingham. We uh, came to assume that the Washington Post would give crappy or no coverage. You know, <laughs> there were exceptions, you know, which was, you know, a right. surprise, but you know, that was sort of part of the terrain. So that certainly sensitized me to later becoming my other things that, you know, a media critic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Anne, would you like to? You have some uh, questions you'd like to? No, I think you covered what I was. What we were talking about last night. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. what, what you learned, basically. Yeah. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, the, uh, and I suppose just um, asking. I mean, maybe we talked about this before, but the uh, when you say events and and maybe the draft and all these things that, that things were moving in a certain direction anyway. Uh, do you see it? much harder for young people today to get involved without cutting them slack saying you shouldn't get involved but is is it tougher today uh, given uh, joblessness uh, uh, cost of college if they go to college uh, uh, I mean I, I think even in this neighborhood there used to be all these activist organizations the rent was you know like hundred dollars a month or something that eight or ten people could share. I'm just wondering if it's harder. When I moved to Portland in 1970, I think my rent was thirty dollars a month. Yeah, you know, I was living decently. Uh, I think part of it, um, for for me, two two of the very big factors were um, that I grew up in a very middle middle class family, 
uh, and I didn't experience anything of my parents experienced in poverty during the Depression, the refrigerator was always full. So my particular way of responding to that mm -hmm. was not to worry. You know, I didn't grow up in scarcity. And the other was that jobs were available if you wanted them. I really didn't want them particularly. <laughs> but they were there, you know, yeah. and uh, the cost of living wasn't r really, really high. You know, not mm -hmm. that we worry about health care, but health care wasn't high. Mm -hmm. Food wasn't that high. Rent wasn't. So the combination of the two for me was, you know, you know not to worry about it, but I think health care is high. Food and housing are high. Jobs are not plentiful. For a combination of reasons, uh, people who are now 15, 20, 25, 30, they have all sorts of um, obstacles to feeling some modicum mm -hmm. of security. And I think that's one factor. There's a political and media zeitgeist which is not that encouraging to activism. I think there are certain issues that are more captivating. For instance, a few days ago here in October 2013, going to the anti-NSA surveillance rally at the Capitol, we've got, uh, you know, there was a lot of young people there, yeah. unusually large proportion of people in their 20s and 30s, because the internet, internet freedom is sort of immediate and resonant, mm -hmm. and I think that's a lot of what's involved, because when you have personal experience that taps you into either anger or attraction to um, a situation, then people take it personally. And in a way, you know, it's like we used to say, personal is political. In a way, that's what galvanizes people. So mm -hmm. I think climate change has, you know, activated a lot of younger people, as I say, mm -hmm. internet, freedom issues, and for, you know, and, and to some extent, war or Wall Street, but it's, it's always a battle with the mass culture, because if in 1965 or 67 or 69, we had done what the Washington Star and the Washington Post wanted us to do. We wouldn't done anything but gone mm -hmm. to school and bought things, you know. Mm -hmm. That was pretty mm -hmm. much it. And whatever extent there was an opening forced, such as they would hire and have Nicholas von Hoffman write in the Post, that was pressure from below because mm -hmm. I think uh, Post editors knew there was, you know, belatedly, but realized something was happening. I mean, mm -hmm. I think a metaphor was, and I went to part of that march to the Lincoln Memorial, but then it went over to the bridge and I, I went home to do my homework. The Pentagon in mm. fall of 67, October, yeah. that was you know, an instance where the very fact of that social turmoil forced the Post to cover it because their predilection would have been not to cover it. And you know, I remember the next day the pages were filled because they were forced at the Post to recognize the editors mm -hmm. being the ones with the power that this was a huge social event, which it was. Mm -hmm. Just uh, when you mentioned uh, about your parents' un unhappiness when you were going out the West, did they uh, 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 come around? I mean, did they generally they'll support you in what you're, you know, to follow your own principles, your own conscience? Was that generally a thing that uh, you got from them? Or, uh, uh, not going to college and not then not staying in college, not going to high school, dropping out of high school and not staying in college. That was beyond the pale for them. At yeah. the same time, they really had a social justice commitment. And after 1971, in the May Day or mass arrest, my mom volunteered at the ACLU to help do the filing so that the loss, class action suit could happen. And I grew up with the ACLU newsletters on the coffee table. So uh, I, I eventually felt a lot of support in this as time went on in the 70s and 80s. And certainly when my, when my books came out, there was basically a gut level anti war. Um, perspective that my parents had. Um, we actually just have a few minutes, so I'm just going to throw in another thing that wasn't really on this year when you were on Democracy Now! with uh, Lawrence Wilkerson, who was the top aide to uh, General Colin Powell when he delivered his infamous United Nations uh, uh, address. Uh, just describe that because it was a great <laughs> takedown of, uh, of, of Wilkerson and Powell, really, of Powell, really. So, uh, well, you know, it's something that I've sort of struggled with because um, my upbringing was that you should always be polite, but my political view is that sometimes you should not be deferential or polite at all. You know, and this was a situation where, um, as you said, uh, Colonel Wilkerson, top aide to Colin Powell, was on Democracy Now! with me, and he's in one studio, I'm in another studio in a different city, and Democracy Now! is in yet another place at their headquarters in New York. Uh, 
And I have to acknowledge that I went in very wary of him because I have felt that uh, Wilkerson has served as Colin Powell's PR flack. And he's sort of made apologies for Powell. Powell doesn't have to do it. Having been very active at the time, as many people were around the buildup to the war in Iraq, the Institute for Public Accuracy, we took apart the next day in our news release analysis what Powell said at the UN in February, February 5th, 2003. Mm -hmm. um, so being brought in so that Powell could again be apologized for de facto by Wilkerson, and Wilkerson just hates Cheney. It's sort of like there's good Republicans and bad Republicans. My boss mm -hmm. was a principled person, but you had these horrible people like Cheney and Rumsfeld. That was his line. Yes, and I just thought yeah. that was very revisionist. So uh, I partly uh, premeditated, partly just uh, spontaneously felt I needed to confront him. And um, so a lot of the claims he was making, well, we all thought that yes. there were weapons of mass destruction, <laughs> where certainly that's not true. Scott Ritter, the former UN weapons inspector, said it wasn't true. A lot of people said it wasn't true. Our institute had debunked at the time, in real time. So I felt it was important to confront. It's difficult because then there's a lot of crosstalk and so forth, but um, the end of the day, and I think in a way we have similarity here now around the NSA spying, there are sort of ersatz oppositional lines put out that we're supposed to uh, feel that the system will work because some people in authority have realized, perhaps relatedly, that principal positions need to be put forward. And so, like, you know, God help us, Diane Feinstein, as we speak, is doing that, you know, a real accomplice to the surveillance state. Wilkerson, again, and I think um, in the case of Powell and Wilkerson, the principal thing to do if you genuinely don't believe in a war that's going forward you quit and you denounce it. And the fact that neither one of them did that mm -hmm. trumps any other retrospective excuse that they're going to my, my favorite part of the uh, broadcast was when you were ticking off <coughs> reason after reason why the, the uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, ploy was a, was a fraud. And Wilkerson said something like, well, Norman, you should have called me. <laughs> <I was there. laughs> and you were talking about the bubble that they're all in, that they... You would never have, I mean, it's absurd that he would say, you, Norman Solomon, are responsible now for not contacting me. I was rendered almost speechless. I, I thought yeah. that I had stumbled down a rabbit hole or something. Uh, yeah. And I suppose he was taken aback because he's usually, unfortunately, been treated somewhat reverentially by anti-war folks. And I thought, uh, how does one connect this to the actual situation where mm -hmm. we as critics of the build-up to the war, at that point, especially... Uh, by February of 2003, uh, we were way beyond any realm that anybody in power had any interest in talking, interest talking with at all. You know, just a quick digression. When I organized the first trip to Baghdad, uh, when Nick Rahal went with us, the still congressperson, mm -hmm. uh, yes, it was difficult to get him there, but we had other people in Congress who were dialoguing with us. But when Gephardt and company, the Democratic leadership, caved in October of 2002 and there was a war resolution, the climate really changed. Okay, Congress is on record for going to war. And so it was not possible, we found, after that point, to get other members of Congress. Because I felt if you keep having members of Congress going to Baghdad, it's going to be harder to bomb. And I think that's an example where when the official story comes down and there's sort of the good work making seal of approval coming from Congress as well as the White House, mm -hmm. you're really behind the eight ball then. So by February 2003, I mean, the war train was rolling. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, uh, Norman or uh, Norman, <laughs> sorry, yes. Paul or Eddie, do you have any question you I do. like to ask? Yeah. I'll yeah, stand over here. Um, I was struck watching a documentary recently about um, the activists in the 60s by, they were describing, I'll just stand behind that. Uh -huh. uh, they were describing, um, somebody was explaining why she joined up in the, um, as an activist and became really uh, involved in SDS, etc. And she said she felt like a revolution was imminent and she wanted to be part of it. Did you ever have that feeling? There was rhetoric about, re there was rhetoric about a revolution is going to happen. And I think it reached the apex in 68, 69. And I was a little bit caught up in that. 
because it was a really alluring concept. And after the Chicago Democratic Convention in August 68, there was sort of that feeling. I remember being part of the marching the day, we call it the counter inaugural, the day before Nixon was inaugurated down Pennsylvania Avenue and so forth. I remember actually a piece that Nicholas von Hoffman wrote in the Post, and he was generally an ally of really strong anti-war uh, mm -hmm. progressive people, saying we should stop talking as though there's going to be a revolution. Mm -hmm. And I think he was correct, you know, but it was a very alluring mm -hmm. notion, especially after the uprising in France in 68, not mm -hmm. only the Sorbonne, but with the workers and so forth. But we weren't realistic. I mean, mayhem and violence in the street is not equivalent uh, to revolution. And the only way that France came close in 68 was that the labor unions were involved. But of course, that was mm -hmm. not to say they wanted to uh, implement an actual revolution. So I think, you know, there are sort of illusions that can be very captivating over a period of time. And mm -hmm. hopefully, there've got to be some real benefits of getting older, because I've noticed there's some disadvantages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And one of the benefits, hopefully, is that, you know, we sort of recognize some patterns that the illusions can really pull us in. And I think that was one by the end of the 60s. And there were, there were several offshoots. There was sort of a hardline Marxist illusion about revolution. Uh, there was also, and I write about it in my Made Love Got War book, uh, there was the sort of the soft power, you might say, green power revolution that Charles Wright, Wright wrote about in his book, The Greening of America, which came out, I think, 1970 or 71. Mm -hmm. That was just another form of re re revolution and illusion. Instead of it being a weather underground, which I remember seeing a film the Antonio did, a documentary about the weather underground when mm -hmm. people were still underground, and I remember walking out of it, it might have been the mid-70s, I thought, most people are out of touch with reality. I mean, at that point, my feet were really on the ground. They are really checked out. You know, they yeah. were so isolated and sort of, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe, I don't know if they were doing drugs or not, but really out there. But there's other ways to have illusions. And uh, the Greening of America was, was totally out, out of connection with how social change and power is maintained, where, you know, in a nutshell, there's consciousness one, the right wing stuff. There's consciousness two, which is like Kennedy liberals, and there's consciousness three, and according to that book, once you get to consciousness three, you're never going to slip back down below it, you know? Mm -hmm. And consciousness three is then going to be that we're all going to transform into a non-corporate, non-militarized society, and we're all going to have, you know, organic peanut butter, you know, which you think he mentioned. And... <laughs> But, you know, it's a nice vision, and I certainly liked it. I identified as a hippie by 1970, a politicized hippie. But clearly, it made no sense. I mean, this guy was, what, a Yale or Harvard professor? It made no sense at all. And in fact, right to his credit, he wrote a book called Opposing the System 25 years ago, and without explicitly saying his previous book had been largely bullshit, <laughs> essentially what he's saying, you know, it's corporate power and militarism. You have to organize effectively against it. Uh, but all that said, the, you know, we're going to have a violent or semi-violent revolution or we're going to have a, uh, a sort of a new age revolution as another sort of illusion. That said, th there's also this terrible illusion that if you just totally trust and work within the system that things are going to be solved. And I think that's, a, that's mm -hmm. as dangerous or more dangerous illusion than any. One of the, um, the things you hadn't mentioned is you uh, last year uh, did run for Congress for an open seat in California has this runoff system where everybody's in the the, the, the primary and then the Republicans and Democrats independents greens whatever and then the top two advanced to the and you missed out by two or three hundred votes from getting into the runoff but given that experience and all your experience over the years I mean what what is the solution this this notion that somehow within the two party system, it can all work out if people yeah. only work hard enough. Is this still true? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> or is this, and well, how do I you think, see that? Yeah. I, I think progressives need to fight for power everywhere we can. Mm -hmm. You know, organizing in the streets, uh, labor unions, schools, community organizations, all sorts of ways to have uh, organizing outside the electoral system and bring mm -hmm. pressure to bear and build our infrastructure and resources. And also electoral power too. We should fight for that power. Every time we can get an Alan Grayson in, in or a Dennis Kucinich or a Barbara Lee, that's really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, 
in terms of strategy, I differentiate between partisan races and nonpartisan races. The mayor of Richmond, California, has been fighting Chevron with great community support. She's a member of the Green Party. She's elected because there's no party designation on the ballot. There are nonpartisan races for mayor right. in California. But there's no really record of a third party uh, candidate running for Congress and winning. So I think as a pragmatic matter, I have no problem with, you know, if the path is through the Democratic Party for Congress, it's just that it, the hierarchy is so rotten in so many ways where the issues war, mm -hmm. surveillance, and so forth. So building that base, I think, is really, really important. And God knows it's tedious. You know, it was running for Congress for me was very difficult. It was exciting. There was a lot of positives. It was very grassroots. Mm -hmm. But it's also not only tedious, but it's very uphill. It's very unrelenting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, I don't think I'm going to run again. I'm 62 years old. But there's a lot of people, and the great example is Bernie Sanders. You start early. You're mm -hmm. connected to communities, and you, 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 can, you can build progressive power. Yeah, and, and seems to be uh, now having some influence on the national debate uh, dis discourse. Yeah, yeah. and I, I meant to mention when we were talking earlier about younger people, certainly Occupy is an example of where many young people were involved and dealing with uh, the huge disparities of wealth and corporate power. I mean, that's been, that's been mm -hmm. great. So, you know, this, there will be emergence of social movements in different ways, you know, knock on wood, including a lot of leadership from, from younger people. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks very much.